If you are vulnerable to psychic damage from roguish language, stay away from these gibbering mouths. But if you intend on listening to this podcast about enriching your fantastical group hallucinations, you're too far gone already. Your next game is going to be a major level up, and here's why. In this episode, we're finding answers to, should we use milestone or experience point advancement? And can we eliminate the drawbacks of both systems? And how could we reward players with more magic items than we ever thought possible? Welcome to the Hook and Chance podcast. I'm Jordan. And I'm his brother, Travis. So I desperately crave being able to level up in real life. (laughs) The, <laughs> I think about it all the time. Where does this craving come from? From my need to feel that little ding <laughs> of like, you did it. So gamer programmed <laughs> that we just, we need, need that next level. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like when I'm cooking breakfast or when I'm just taking a shower, I want <laughs> the universe to be like, you're doing good. <laughs> that explains the scream from the kitchen the other morning. Where the fuck is my level up? Where's the experience bar? Exactly. I made damn good eggs. Although I think that would also make my comparing myself to others extremely excruciating as well. <laughs> God damn it. They're like 50 levels ahead. <laughs> We're really uncovering some stuff for you, huh? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, let's look at some of the skills that you do have. Sure. We've got um, dungeon mastering. Uh huh. Batman trivia. That's at least a seven. Yeah. Thanks. Out of what? A hundred or ten? <laughs> <laughs> so that's about it. Nothing super useful. You can balance stuff on your face. True. Higher level at that than most people. That's an eight. Out of a hundred or out of ten? Why do you keep assuming <laughs> that the bar is a hundred? <laughs> Just saying. I would need to know. Yeah. Well, fair enough. It's out of ten. Let's, let's say ten. We'll save you from whatever... This torpedo <laughs> trajectory that you are on right now. All right, all right. Well, obviously today we're talking about leveling up, and we're going to shift over to talking about Dungeons and Dragons rather than my life. So Jordan and I wanted to tackle the question of how do you narratively level, but this kind of opened up this can of worms conversation around how do you level in the first place? And what do you use? Do you use milestone leveling or XP leveling? And there seems to be a ton of contention and vitriol and anger around which system is better. If you were to go on any Facebook or Reddit forum about this topic, you will see two very distinctly different camps. Yeah. Yeah, it's like one of the most ancient fights in the hobby, I think. (laughs) Like... As old as the blood war between the devils and the demons in D&D. Never-ending combat, neither side willing to give up an inch. And also very much likely to turn into a flame war. Yeah, that's true. So we're going to explore this entire topic and maybe, just maybe, bring some peace to this war and maybe look at it from a couple of different angles. Maybe we can figure out which one is best. Maybe. Or maybe it's that they were both good the entire time. I know that's hard to believe, but bear with us. Well, to us, it feels a little bit like the Yancey Laurel thing, the sound clip that broke the internet where everyone was hearing a different thing. Or like the black and blue or white and gold dress where people demanded that it was the way they saw it. Well, and like the conversation around D&D leveling tools... You have two different people looking at the same thing and seeing something completely different. So could it be that we're just seeing the same thing from two different angles? Impossible, the internet says. You have to choose a side in the blood war. Well, we're going to talk about what makes each one good for certain groups at the table, the problems that can arise, and how we would go about solving them all in the strategy stateroom. This is the Strategy Stateroom, where inventive and cunning tactics are crafted for when they're needed most.
So as we dive into this whole topic about XP and milestone leveling, it might behoove us to do a bit of a recap. Behoove! So if you're new to this conversation, according to D&D and many other tabletop RPGs, players gain character advancement and unlock new abilities as your character goes on adventures and overcomes challenges. That's the vague terminology used in the book. He or she gains experience represented by experience points. Seems simple enough. Sure. So the XP system. Specifically, D&D has challenge ratings attached to monsters, and those challenge ratings correspond to experience points. And then, on page 82 of the Dungeon Master's Guide, you have tables that can help you choose the right amount of XP to give based on a particular challenge. Then, of course, there is also guidance to, number one, determine the XP threshold. Then, number two, you have to determine the party's XP threshold. Then, number three, uh, total the monster's XP. And then, number four, you actually have to use the XP multipliers for multiple monsters. And then you have to add or subtract based on the party size. I hate this. <laughs> so did a lot of people. So not surprisingly, many DMs have tossed this system entirely for the milestone system. Which is where you level up when the dungeon master thinks it's appropriate or you've accomplished something worth character advancement, a major goal of some type. It's simple and streamlined and you do zero math in the calculations. And a lot of folks really tend towards this style of leveling because it can fit really well with your story. But in order to really give these two systems their day in court, we should go through some steps. So first we're gonna look at using XP-based leveling. Then we're gonna look at using milestone leveling and see how these different approaches affect your games. And then we're gonna see if we can maybe find a nice approach that blends, dare we say, both. Neat. All right, so let's get into the conversation about experience-based leveling without just shitting on it. Because <laughs> I think you know that we have a preference. But with this approach, you get more control over what kind of gameplay gets rewarded. And you can reward much more than simply killing monsters. You can give out experience for great role play or creativity or character development. You can kind of tailor the game to what you all find important at the table. That being said, new DMs often come to the intuitive conclusion, based on the way that all of this is worded and designed, that the goals of Dungeons & Dragons are to kill monsters. It took me a while to get over that hump and realize that there are a lot of more interesting goals to throw at the party than simply killing a monster. Yeah, it's kind of where a lot of folks tend to start. Because it is inherently baked into the game. There is an XP system, and attached to that is a whole bunch of monster challenge ratings that account for some XP. And if you kill the monster, you get the XP. The challenge here is that the monsters give the XP, and player characters' abilities are mostly focused on killing. And it takes a very, very small hop to get to the point where you go, well, if a monster is worth this much, then how much is that person over there worth? <laughs> That's a dark path. It's a very dark path. Yeah. And this can drag attention away from role playing and character development unless the DM is specifically trying to reward those certain actions. So they have to be super diligent in saying, yes, I'm going to reward great role playing. Totally. Like, do not give experience points out for killing innocent townspeople, perchance. <laughs> Unless everyone's down for that evil campaign where they become the villains, of course. The other challenge that Jordan and I find with this is that, like we were saying, XP for killing monsters is inherently baked in there. What isn't baked in there is how much experience to reward for a really good diplomatic conversation. Or making a really good ice cream sandwich. <laughs> That's got to be worth 30 XP? At least. Come on, you get a good sandwich. But once a DM realizes that monsters can be used as challenges on the way to those more interesting goals, 
then the game can become about so much more about creatively overcoming these obstacles rather than just, I killed it, I win. Well, and then we're back to the same challenge. How much XP do you reward for not necessarily killing those monsters, but then also getting the golden chalice from inside that dark, scary dungeon? Yeah. But it does feel so good and so satisfying to see that sweet experience bar fill up. I would agree with you there because I am of the type that likes to see my resources dwindle. And I like to see my XP bar fill up. Yeah. I want to know if my character is down to their last arrow so that that drives a little bit more character development. I want to know that they're down to the last arrow because they're about to use it as a dagger because that's all they have left. The same thing is true with my XP bar. I wouldn't mind seeing that slowly fill up and seeing a visual representation of, damn, I am getting really good at this thing. There's a reason that almost every type of game that's being made today includes some kind of leveling up or advancement. It's so psychologically satisfying for human beings. I mean, words with friends has a level up system. <laughs> it's literally Scrabble. Yeah, I mean, all kinds of companies, not even gaming companies are doing it. I think Starbucks has the leveling up system <laughs> when you're buying drinks. We're adding gamification to everything, so it's no surprise that people want to see their bar fill. Yeah. That being said, some people are more drawn to this than others to some degree, and it does have the potential to take the focus away from other parts of a game and just center that spotlight on how do I get more of this sweet stuff, this experience. So again, if the DM isn't really paying attention to how they're doling out XP, this leads to this nickel and diming for XP and constantly badgering the DM for, ah, oh, I want that extra 20 XP. Are you going to reward me for making that <laughs> ice cream sandwich? No, it wasn't reward worthy. Chill out. Let's move on. Let's stop stopping the flow of the game to discuss how much XP we got for that one encounter. Yeah. And then we come to the question of, do I give group XP? Does everyone get the same amount of XP every time it is doled out? Or do I give it out individually because every character is doing their own kind of thing in this wonderful game of creativity? Some of the other benefits to doing that that it should be noted is that it does allow kind of a drop-in style where only the most dedicated D&D players come to the session to get XP. Which, yeah, that's true. It can kind of lead to... Uh, being jealous of the person with the most XP from people that haven't showed up to every session because they have other responsibilities in life. <laughs> Pasha to other responsibilities. <laughs> I'm sorry, but it does happen. Well, and then you have the same XP, which is great because it kind of creates that air of teamwork, which you can approach as, hey, we all beat this giant monster. Now let's split the XP individually. The danger there is that you are causing a situation where players are now getting into the nitty gritty of, well, who did the most damage? Well, is it damage or is it healing like the cleric's doing? And what is that healing worth in this battle? Okay, well, let's not do individual XP. Let's split it as a group and let's all share it. But then you get into another weird scenario where, well, that person really wasn't helping all that much. <laughs> Okay, so there is a lot of flexibility with the way that you dole out experience, and we're kind of saying that it's better when it's not just for killing stuff, but there should still be an agreed-upon method at the table where all of the rules are expressed to everybody about how experience is given out. So yeah, absolutely. It, although I would say that this wouldn't be the first and only time that anyone has ever reneged on an agreement that they arrived at six months ago in a campaign and said, ah, now I'm not sure how I'm feeling about it because so-and-so isn't really pulling their weight. The other danger there is that if you do have somebody who maybe isn't the most shining star in the group who somehow manages to get rewarded XP, then it starts to call into question some favoritism issues around oh, well, the DM really likes your play style, but doesn't really like my play style. And also you two are buddies. You hung out on the weekends. Yeah, and that is not a good look for you as a DM. 
And if it really continues, then it almost gets into this dark power dynamic where all the players are dancing to your every whim as you decide on the fly what will get experience in this session and what won't. And I think that's maybe the challenge that a lot of folks do have with XP leveling is that it assumes the image of being very systematic. Although when you peel back the layers, very similar to just DMing in general, there isn't a hard set of rules that anybody is really following. Yeah, which the way I like to play is a pretty big deal. Like when you purely follow experience leveling, it can cause situations where characters all of a sudden gain a new superpower, like right in the middle of a dungeon or in the middle of a fight, they're all of a sudden able to fly. They couldn't before. <laughs> you successfully jumped over the crevasse and feel about uh, 13 points healthier on the other side. <laughs> yeah. So if we can agree that the foundation of this system where we grant XP, this system that seems so rock solid is actually kind of built on quicksand because it's all subjective. And we're playing a very different kind of game today than we were, say, when this system originated from the beginnings of D&D, when the rule set was more of an offshoot of war games and not really ideally suited for games that might incorporate more than just a dungeon crawl. Then we're left with this question of what else works? Enter milestone leveling. So milestone leveling, like I mentioned earlier, is really that a uh, storytelling method of saying, okay, we've reached a critical point. This feels like a natural place to say, yeah, you gain some new skills. You have a moment to reflect upon all of the dangers you've faced. And it can work really well with linear storytelling. And I know that some people see that as its own can of bad worms that you should avoid slurping down. But like when you're using a pre-written adventure, Milestone leveling is baked into those usually because it, it's just so simple to keep players in an appropriate and therefore fun level for all the challenges that are in that adventure. Yeah, if you were using XP leveling and things start getting out of whack with a pre-written adventure, you've kind of got all of those natural stopping points baked right in there and all of the players get to go along and it does tend to keep players focused on the story. That's what's really nice about milestone leveling is that they're not looking for that next hit of dopamine at every single level. They're just saying, yeah, we're along for this story. Here we go. Uh, I'm going to forget about this. You tell us when we level up. Yeah. And then it'll be really fun when we do. And it's not limited to that. It also helps when you're running an adventure of your own design in the same kind of way. It helps with the story structure overall. You can sit there and plan out some good moments of level ups. I've even talked to DMs who structure their stories into chapters, and they just simply put the level up at the end of the chapter. They treat each section of their game very much like it's a pre-written adventure. Hey, we're going to do this one story, and when we get to the end of it, then you level up, then we move on. Now, the challenge with this approach, it is not faultless, because this can often create an environment where players just assume that they have no say in the story direction and that they're on a linear path. That choosing the safe or dangerous path really doesn't have any effect on their character progression. Therefore, why bother? Right, like why, why explore the world even? Why do anything but that main story quest if I want to level up? I'll just kind of sit here until the DM throws story at me. And if the DM is sitting there really rigidly following that plan, that can be bad. Like, sometimes I start this way and then get weird with it when the players do want to go off track. And if you don't, then the danger is they go off track for like 30 sessions and you're still <laughs> waiting for that next story beat to level them up. Yeah. It doesn't really work. Or you continue to level them up while they do this deviation from your main story and you're coming back and now all of a sudden all of your enemies that you had planned for that space or that section have to be like five levels higher because they've been dicking around over there for ages. Yeah. They're older. They're wiser. They're coming <laughs> back to your story. Give that goblin six extra arms. What I like about milestone leveling is that it's uh, really cooperative. When everyone's leveling up at that same time and there's no real question of when it's going to happen, it prevents 
any of that power envy from creeping in. That's true. And it really does just allow all of the players to be on the same scale. And that's kind of the way that D&D is built, especially 5th edition, is that all of the players are scaling at the same time. They're, they're getting new cool powers around the same stages in their character's journey. And listen, I know that characters can be different levels, but anytime I've been on the losing side of that, on the lower level side of that equation, I'm not enjoying the game nearly as much. I don't know if that makes me a piece of trash or not. That's just the way I feel about it. I think it simply makes you human because there is only one way to lose, and that is feeling like you're losing in a storytelling <laughs> game. Cooperative storytelling. The other downside to this whole cooperative storytelling piece is that it does leave the opportunity for certain players who are not nearly as invested in the game to simply coast. Like when you're not fighting for every scrap of XP that the DM could possibly hand out, why try harder? This would really allow anybody knowing that, hey, my level up is coming as long as the entire party is still alive and I'm not dead, I'm going to get leveled up at the next milestone if we make it to that story beat. Here we go. You know what? Uh, I'm just going to shop on Etsy on my phone instead. <laughs> yeah. I was thinking in game, not out of game. I was thinking like sitting back smoking <laughs> cigars and chewing bubble gum. But well, there's that too. Another thing I like about it, though, is that it's a much easier approach for new DMs. Like we said, we got less math going on, less learning about all these specific encounter balance rules. You just give a level up when it feels right. Just surf it like a wave and do it <laughs> when you feel it. Easy, hippie. There's a lot of skills in this game to master, and experience is one that you can set aside for later once you've got some of the basics down. Narrative leveling really does give the players a lot of emphasis on just get into it and roleplay your character. Since there isn't a lot of XP built into the systems, this is all we have left. We have narrative. We have roleplaying. This is what we're here to do. And therefore, the milestone allows players to just kind of relax, get into character, enjoy the journey, enjoy the story, that the DM has crafted. I'll agree but disagree, and I'll fight back a bit by saying that's what some people are there to do, but other people are there for that gritty, deeply mechanical experience. That's fair. And that's why this is such a discussion. <laughs> but the more time I spend with milestone leveling, the more I can integrate storytelling opportunities into the character's level ups, especially my character's level ups if I'm playing in a game like that. Like, does my character spend some downtime developing their skills or do they have a moment of revelation before an important challenge? How am I leveling up in the story world? Well, don't give away too many of those because I think we're going to dive more into some of those narrative reasons how you can level up and how you can work it into that story piece because that is also incredibly important and incredibly juicy and that's what I'm playing for. Absolutely. Okay, so if we're going to create a new kind of system... We need one that will solve some of the challenges of the different types of leveling. So we've got XP leveling, which introduces a ton of complicated math. You've got balance issues of players that don't show up to a game, and then all of a sudden you got balances all over the place. And then you kind of have the leveling up at odd times of XP leveling that's kind of a challenge. Then you have the lack of role-playing rewards that is kind of sitting with XP leveling that you don't specifically get rewarded for great role-play. And then on the milestone side, you've got the challenges of kind of player autonomy and kind of taking decisions of milestone leveling because they don't feel like they can direct the story necessarily. Then you have the problem of players potentially coasting because they know that their level up is coming no matter what they do. And the lack of risk-taking in milestone leveling because, God, if I can just stay alive, then I'll make it to that next milestone. Yeah, that's a lot of issues. So if we were to propose a system that did try to address some of these, this is what it would look like. 
you could simplify it by making each level three to five experience points, if you want to call them that, or you could call them milestones. Or character growth points to a particular level. Right. So this kind of goes back to that whole Yancey Laurel thing, is the difference between handing out one point, which is milestone leveling, or 10,000 points, which is XP leveling, <laughs> pretty much. You're just simplifying it to five so that there's a few more stages than one. Yeah, and a few less than 10,000 or 30,000. Okay. Well, an Adventurer's League seems to work fairly well, so seems like a great system. True, but I think it can address more of these problems if you allow players to choose their own points. They reward themselves throughout a level rather than you saying, as the DM, you get a point. Wait a minute. That sounds like complete anarchy that you were proposing by giving the players the control of when they level up? Right, and I see your concern, <laughs> and it's valid. I'm now level 70. But you can't do that because the third rule is that each member of the party is unable to actually level up until every character has their points for that level. And those points are going to be based on, you know, whatever everyone values. Now, if everyone at the table does love killing stuff, then they're getting points for killing stuff. But if they want to base it more on big role-playing moments or social or character arc development, whatever they want, they can reward themselves for. So you have a rogue who's an assassin who is literally killing people and cleared all five people off their list. And since this was core to their character, they chose these events as the points that they would accumulate and be required before their next level. Whereas you have, say, the cleric who gets blessed by their god and shown a higher level of consciousness and they gained all five points all at once. And then the druid gained their points from... Touching a lot of cows. <laughs> Stop touching those cows. <laughs> like petting That's them. weird. Petting them. Pe okay. Touching is another word for petting. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> but yeah, it just provides so much flexibility in the way that the players want to approach the game. The other thing that I like about this is that it means that once I have gained all five of my points and I've doled them out to myself... Because you're a big, selfish fathead? Sure, I am indeed a big, <laughs> selfish fathead. And I've said, you know what? I'm going to do all of these right now. These big story role-playing focused points happened in my own character's development or I became a better friend to this person in the party. Or you're just in your environment for whatever reason at that point in the game. Sure. sure. So I've decided that I've gotten all my points... Now I'm pretty much just going to be sitting back and focusing my energies on maybe helping every other player at the table move their story forward in the direction that they could gain their points. And at best, that means you're invested in everyone else's characters. And at worst, it means you, the spotlight hog, are sitting back and allowing someone else to take the spotlight so that you can move to the next point and get your spotlight back. Wow, I think that works. Perhaps it will. Well, I think that solves a lot of the issues that we talked about. No complicated math. You got player autonomy in there. They determine their own milestones. You've got balance issues taken care of because they're all leveling up at the same time. They're not leveling up at weird times that they don't think is appropriate or in the middle of combat. There is still a little bit that's missing to me. And that is that progress bar or those little rewards along the way, along your journey that allow you to feel really accomplished. How do we tackle that? Well, don't worry because there's still so much that it, from the DM side, you can reward the party with. You got stuff like inspiration baked right into the fifth edition rule. Inspiration being advantage again for whenever the player wants to use it. Like that's pretty sweet. That's a gift that keeps on giving. You can spend that however you want. You can give them interesting little character arc side quests that are really focused on somebody and their challenges to help them achieve their personal goals. So to explore that further, this would be like, say, having all of the players at the table decide 
who they want to focus on in terms of a personal side story based on who's been role playing the best or based on whatever they want. What's most interesting. That's a novel approach. (laughs) And finally, something that we all cherish close to our hearts is treasure magic (laughs) items. The lifeblood of D&D. No, no, no. Because then you get into that scenario where everybody has a plus three sword and you can't give them any more overpowered treasure because it's throwing your whole game out of the whack. Yeah, they've got gauntlets that can punch gods from this plane of existence and (laughs) boots that rocket them around the planet. But we've got a solution for that too. In the Temple of Inspired Hands, we're going to talk about how to approach magic items in a way that doesn't break everything every time. This is the Temple of Inspired Hands, where amazing products and revolutionary ideas are brought to light. So in this Temple of Inspired Hands, we have a list of 100 low-level magic items by Dr. Clockwork from Reddit. And this was one of those lists, again... We don't love lists. We're not (laughs) list people, but we seem to find some pretty good lists. Well, that's because we sort through all the crap ones, because mostly when it comes to a list like this, I'm so excited to see it. And then I'm just not really like pumped up by what's on it. Yeah, you'll take like one or two ideas from the list and it'll make your sub list of two, which really isn't a list. (laughs) A list of two does not count. So Dr. Clockwork freely admits to having collected these from various places around the internet and making some of them up, but they're on the D100 subreddit. And of course, we will leave a link in the show notes so you can go and find this list. But it is awesome. You got to explore this with us a little bit. It's super fun. Some of the nice things are that every one of these items is exactly what they say in the title. There's precisely nothing that's game-breaking about these items. Every one of these items is a total banger. Like, some of them are funny, some of them are cool, some of them are great references to (laughs) pop culture. This list is just fantastic. And I don't know if you have these moments in your games where you're DMing, but you just think, I want to get weird. I want (laughs) to put something weird in right now, and I, I don't know what to do. Well, and here's the other challenge that I have with magic items. Sure, giving a plus one sword feels good, but it's not gonna, it's not gonna create moments in the game that everyone talks about forevermore because magic items, like the robe of useful items, is gonna throw something random into the mix that a plus one sword just never will. Yeah. And that's how it creates really fun stories that everyone references for years to come. But some of those high-level magic items that throw weird stuff in can change the course of a game. But players like you and I still want magic items. We still want neat shit. So if you can't give a plus one sword or a plus three sword every second game, and you don't want to give total garbage, and you don't want to give out robes of useful items then what are you left with? Well, that's where this list comes in. And we can give a couple of examples. You've got the frying pan of fire, a cast iron frying pan that allows the user to cast heat metal once per day. If you're a chef or a cook, the party cook, that's a great item to have. It's character focused and it gives a cool ability. They can be cooking in their downtime anytime. You've got Bigger Knife. This one made me laugh out loud. A large dagger that provides plus one to hit and plus one to intimidation. The dagger will grow to be slightly larger than anyone else's dagger in the room. On a failed intimidation check, the knife will turn into a spoon till dawn. (laughs) So it's either going to be a wonderfully useful weapon or a spoon. (laughs) Or a spoon. (laughs) Is it a plus one spoon? I suppose so. I want a plus. I want more plus one cutlery as a character. <laughs> I think that'll really increase my effectiveness. You've got the cloak of grace, which allows the user to cast feather fall once per day. The spell that makes you float gently to the ground 
and you billow majestically at all other times. On any natural one your character rolls, the cloak will get caught in something. <laughs> so you're either super graceful or super clumsy with your cape. Then you've got Dr. Wittershin's Discount Healing Potions, a standard healing potion with god-awful taste. Usually rancid leeches or rooster's feet. A DC 10 constitution check is needed to down this without it coming back up. I love that. I love, I, I need more of this in my games because all of these potions are so masterfully crafted that there's got to be a thousand times more potions that weren't. Well, we don't have a cough syrup on the face of the earth that is easy to get down. <laughs> Why would all potions be just yeah. bottoms up? Or, you know, you've got your favorite coffee that goes down real smooth. But to get there, you needed to taste a lot of shit. <laughs> then you've got the Trampish Bag of Dreams, a fine leather bag that looks, sounds, and appears to be full of gold. Really, it's just an empty bag that can't hold anything except the occasional moth. I love trickery items. I mean, this one has the potential to mess around with the game a good degree. Well, the next time that the players get pickpocketed in the big city, you know, this is working to their advantage. But also, yeah, you can have so much trickery going on there. The big boastful player is always jangling that big pouch of gold, even though there's nothing inside it. Or you're trying to make deals. That you're going to obviously not follow through on. because <laughs> <laughs> Nice. Check out my big bag of gold. Well, again, you can find that on Reddit. It's on the D100 subreddit. But again, we'll leave a link in the description. I personally want to play in a game where this is the only form of advancement. No leveling. Just getting these weird magic items. <laughs> and you all start out as commoners. And you can just keep collecting them. And then over the course of having 50 of these weird ass items, you actually have some capability. Yeah. <laughs> or wow. at the very least, be like one of those people performing down at the pier. That's a one person super band. Oh, great. <laughs> yeah, that sounds like a riveting game of D&D. &D. <laughs> Heck yes. Well, thank you very much for listening to this episode. This show takes quite a bit to produce. And it's all worth it because we really, really appreciate some of the interaction that you've brought us and the comments that you've given us and the patronage of some of the phenomenal listeners of this show. These are the folks that truly help us level up as podcasters and keep us going. You got Icy Spiders, Sean J, The Senate, Lucas D, Lila G, The GM Tim, Duke B, Thomas W, Ty N, Heavy Arms, Eric R, Aldrust, Leprechaun, and the incomparable Will HP. Thank you all very, very much. We appreciate you so darn much you'll never know. Indeed. Thanks to Tabletop Audio for the sound effects you heard in this episode. You can follow us at Hook and Chance on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and Reddit. You can also join the awesome community of those same patrons players, and DMs by joining our Discord. Thanks, Thanks for, for listening, listening and, and demand weird games. loot. <laughs> See how far this is.